Oh, all right, um, is it all mine now? Okay. Let's yes, see all yours. Right. Great, great, great. Okay, so first off, let's share the PowerPoint here. Okay, is it, Becca, can you just give me a thumbs up? You see a blank white screen? All right, great, great. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cam. And first off, thanks, Becca, for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about accessibility. Um, I'm going to practice inclusive presentations, so you may hear me describe images on screen, and I'm going to describe myself in just a moment here, because this is all part of that big accessibility practice. So I'm a white, white male, 30-something-year-old, uh, today I'm wearing a gray shirt, a off-blue uh, t-shirt, and a snazzy black accessibility cap with the hashtag A11Y on it. Uh, so let's get this started here. And if everyone can just help me out here, um, I'm very interactive in my chats. Can everyone just give me a quick emoji check? Um, pop open the chat and put your favorite emoji in there. I really appreciate that just to make sure I'm being heard properly. I'm going to put mine in there. Everyone's got a favorite emoji. I don't mind which ones, but a snake. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Is that a snake? Python. Yeah, of course. I see fish. Surely put a, a nerd with glasses. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, perfect. Stars, awesome. Okay, great, great. This is just perfect. So I'm gonna take us back here to, oh, did my camera just die? Do you still see me? Uh, no, we're seeing your profile oh, picture. Let me try that again. Technical difficulties, that's why we, that's why I start with the emojis first. So I know everyone's listening and then I can have tech issues and no problem. <laughs> <It> always happens. <laughs> always happens. Always happens. Okay. Let's try one more time. Uh, start that video. Should be back again. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to take us back to 1945 um, when the U.S. Air Force was facing a really big problem. What happened was that pilots couldn't control their aircrafts. So on screen, I've got an image of an airplane that looks like it's been crashed into a field. Um, and the US Air Force didn't know why that was happening. Um, when they were building airplanes, they used data from a book that was written over 100 years prior in 1835 by a Belgian scientist who was the first one to ever use data to map what an average human looks like. And that's kind of how we build tech these days, isn't it? You know, the, the average person can use a carousel. The average person knows what a required field is. That should be all good, right? Well, so at, this, at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the U.S., they started to retest everybody because, of course, the great American physique had grown. And let's retest everyone to see what their head size and their chest size and leg length and arm length is again. So they got all this data. They got all these metrics once again. I want everyone to tell me, so open up that chat one more time if you closed it. I'd like you to tell me how many people, as a percentage, were quote-unquote average across all 10 metrics. There were 3,000 people that were retested. How many do you think, as a percentage, were considered average on all 10 counts? Back up at 1%. Waiting for a couple of other answers here. 0.5%. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So 0% of people at the Air Force Base were actually considered average. And that's pretty amazing because they went and retested people and said, well, how many across all of these people are average on only three metrics? And it was less than 5%. So they'd actually built airplanes for nobody. And once again, that's kind of how we build technology. We're still in that phase right now. We think that, hey, this is an average person. Let's build something for average. It's good to go. So there was a flurry of new technology that was, uh, was, was um, analyzed and rebuilt. So on screen, I've got an image of foot pedals of one of those aircrafts. And you can see how the pedals shift back and forward. And there's a stick shift and stuff like that. Because all this new research came out on adaptability. So we have adjustable foot pedals and helmets and suits and, and seats. Can you imagine before that? Seats didn't even move forward and backwards. And the amazing thing was that pilots' performance soared. And this is actually how the study of ergonomics was born in the United States. And there was a big focus on adaptability versus just average. So what does it have to do with software development? Well, other than what I just mentioned, 
accessibility can sometimes be dry. It can sometimes be regulatory. And I'm not sure how many of the audience members here have heard of accessibility before or have actually had to do work on accessibility. I'm gonna ask a few questions around that in a little bit, but I love starting talks when I talk about addressing mindset. I tell a story like this, it starts to get people warmed up to it because if you start off by just talking about guidelines and lawsuits, well, you kind of tune people out. We say, oh my God, I'm scared of accessibility because the auditor is going to come knocking down or lawsuits are going to come happening. And, uh, and that's not the way to go. And plus, now you can all consider yourselves airplane cockpit experts as well, right? You got to focus on adaptability because we need more accessibility champions in our industry, we need it more than ever before. And I really believe that that starts in the world of technology, in developers and anyone who has that kind of space around that technology. Yes, it's, to it's true that uh, there's like a top-down approach where your VP or your like the CEO, they come and say, well, accessibility is a priority now. But each of us, the, ground, the grassroots movement starts with the developers and the designers and the testers. If we make it important in our job, well, there's going to be no choice when the regulators or someone does come to the company and say, you need to pay attention to this. It's already, that movement has already started. So advocates, specialists, consultants, developers, designers, testers, I think everyone can be a champion. And that's, that's kind of where I come from. On screen, I've got an image of a pretty intimidating looking boardroom here with, uh, I don't know, 15 odd men sitting around a boardroom table. And before we get into the code, I don't know if you've been in this situation before where you're staring down a boardroom full of intimidating looking, I don't know, managers or senior executives or something like that. Well, maybe, okay, maybe not in this situation, but maybe these are your clients or maybe these are your, if you're a freelancer or maybe this is just your team. And I would hope that at the end of this conversation, you can bring back a few skills of accessibility and even start that voice within your own organization to say, you know, maybe we should look at alternative text or maybe we should think about labels a different way. Because um, I don't want, you know, I think that this whole movement has, has a lot of push right now. And there's an idea that accessibility is really time consuming or it's kind of boring or it's, it's got to cost a lot of money to fix this kind of stuff. But that's just simply not true if you start at the right spot. If it ain't fun, don't do it. I, don't, I doubt that Jack Canfield was the first one uh, to come up with this, but hey, I, I put this in Google images and found this one, so it's good enough. Because if you don't make it fun, nobody's going to do it. And accessibility should be about those micro improvements and the forward motion of accessibility. So practical digital accessibility for developers. I don't know what your skill set is. Uh, maybe, and maybe you're like a brand newbie um, in the world of development. I'd love it if for a second, if you could just put what your, you know, what you think your skill level is, or if you've had any experience about accessibility before, I would love to know, uh, kind of, it helps me shape this conversation as well. If I need any examples, if you do WordPress, put it in the chat. If you do Angular or Jake uh, or uh, React, put that in the chat. If you're, um, you know, if you do anything else, if you're like a Wix, Weebly, uh, uh, Webflow type of developer and you build stuff like that for clients, let me know that too. I'll try and shape some of my examples in here to fit what, what's important for the crowd here. Lisa, you just put, I need a way to make alt text fun for my clients. And hopefully I, you'll get that by the end of this conversation. And also, if you have any questions throughout this call, uh, just let me know in the chat. I'm pretty good about balancing all these at the same time. So I'm going to start the very basics here. What is accessibility? Um, I want you to imagine something just for a second here. Uh, imagine you're doing a redesign. You're working on a banking project or something like that. And your client says, OK, we've got this new app coming out. And uh, it's got new features and it's got better content with fancy colors and things like that and great API integrations. Maybe you're already working on a project like that right now. Well, what if they came and told you, well, it's only actually for the iPhone. We're not building anything like that for Android right now. So there's no Android launch. Well, that would be totally unacceptable, right? We'd be calling that bank. We'd be calling our leaders and being like, what are you thinking? You know, no Android launch. This is 2022 or this is not, this is not right. But that's exactly what happens when users of assistive technology have their needs and their concerns as an afterthought, okay? A few statistics here, uh, 1.3 billion people globally have disabilities. It's estimated. 
60 million in the United States, which is actually the largest minority group in the US. And uh, so that means 19.3% of Americans self-identify as having a disability. I don't like to stay on these stats too long because these numbers are so large, it starts to feel like, what kind of change can I do to really affect 1.3 billion people? It's just too tough. So you might be thinking those things, it's too complex, it's too many rules, these guidelines, were web content accessibility guidelines, what is this? So in Canada here, I'm not sure if anyone's from Canada, we didn't do a check to see where people are from, but there are these really small changes. And I really believe in small changes can equal big results. Uh, if you're Canadian, let me know in the chat. But in, in Canada, our money actually has some accessibility features. They are coming to the US, your $10 bill as well. But in Canada, we've got these tactile features on the top of our bills. So this means that persons who have visual impairments can identify bills in their wallet. Because in Canada, just like in the US, all the bills are the same dimension, right? In, in Europe and in other countries, bills are bigger based on the denomination. But here, identifying the money in your wallet is a challenge. And if you weren't able to see, if you had sight issues or if your the degradation of your eyesight happened over a period of time and you couldn't identify the money in your wallet, I mean, that's to me what really kind of matters here. That's important. But it's not just small companies that are doing this, right? It's not just some advocate who's coming speaking. There's big companies going out and doing things on accessibility as well. On screen, I've got the Microsoft Adaptive Controller, and Microsoft has done a really good job at making accessibility a top priority. We tend to think when you're just starting off with accessibility, you think of accessibility equals blind. Maybe you've seen a screener before, or experienced a screener before, but Microsoft says, hey, we got this really cool thing. This thing only costs about hundred bucks, by the way, not that much more than an Xbox controller too, so pretty cool. Because the CEO of Microsoft his son is, uh, was severely disabled. He passed away recently and there was a big community event around that. And they are leading the way. Maybe you've noticed in Word, in PowerPoint, in Excel, a little bit of Excel, that there are these accessibility checkers that have become more and more vocal in the way you do it. In fact, I know people who work at Microsoft who say, you know, before you can send an email off, have you checked it for accessibility? So it's totally cool. This, this, this type of thing. And in, in the back, there's even uh, all these ports, which you can plug in any type of uh, adaptive controller you want. And on the screen, I've got different types of adaptions that you can use with that as well. On the right-hand side, there's a sip puff device and um, there's toggles and buttons and things like that too. But what's cool is that even the unboxing is accessible, like product design. This is pretty cool. There's large handles, none of that flimsy packaging you got to rip open and stuff like that to, so that someone with, say, cerebral palsy would be able to unbox this and use and, and game for the probably even the first time in their life without needing any help. On screen, I've got an image of some friends of mine who are in Montreal. They own a company called All Access Life. On the left uh, is Brad. On the right is Daniel. Um, Brad has nonverbal, I always have to read this, a nonverbal spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. He cannot control the muscles in his body. But all of a sudden, him and his support worker are able to now game online um, uh, with help. So what Brad does is he's got two buttons on the side of his headrest. And so when he wants to shoot, this, I think this game is just some shooter game, he can move his head from side to side and activates the different buttons, like the A and B buttons on, your, uh, on the controller, whereas Daniel can go and control the ship. Like, that's cool. There's a whole line of streamers now, accessible streamers. So this has allowed that to, to a whole new group of individuals. So what is accessibility? It really is about that inclusion. It's about getting your app or your product or your software or your website or your service or whatever you have usable by as many people as possible. And like I said before, as technical folks, I think we have a really important role in the business. And it's even more especially true in smaller organizations, you know, where you may wear multiple hats, like <laughs> you may be the developer, designer, tester, systems architect, you're doing it all at once, right? So sometimes you have to pay attention to, to multiple things as you're building. So if you're on one of those teams, maybe you've got that forgotten JIRA board of accessibility issues that you haven't looked at in a while, um, maybe it's time to go revisit that kind of thing. 
because accessibility is more than just ARIA tags. Uh, it's more than just regulation. It's more than just the web content accessibility guidelines. It really is about that whole holistic kind of view. It's about ramps on sidewalks. It's about buttons to open doors. It's about Siri. You know, Siri was actually developed as an accessibility. So that's the why. Let's talk a little bit about the business of accessibility here, because I'm not sure if there's anyone here who manages a team or who is in that kind of VP kind of space, but seven out of 10 users who have disabilities will click away from a website that they find frustrating or difficult to use. Something really uh, as simple as if I'm using a screen reader and I can't interact with, uh, with a button because there's no label on it, well, how do I know what that button does? Does it close a modal? or does it liquidate my bank account, right? Like, well, I, I don't even know what that does. If the submit button doesn't have a proper label on it, that starts to be a really big problem. And they found that persons with disabilities have, um, are even more, I wanna say, uh, habitual than, than other users. So when they find something that works, they stick with it more than anything else. And they'll go and tell their 13 to 15 people that this really works, so uh, uh, don't move away from it. So there's something called a hidden market. In Canada, we're at $55 billion of persons with disabilities. This is their buying power. It's an untapped market. In the UK, they're up to $383 billion as an untapped market. And finally, of course, in the US, who has to beat everybody, $645 billion is the purchasing power of people with disabilities, which is just, just huge. Um, I thought I'd remove this slide, but I just saw it kind of come up. On screen, I've got um, a slide of lawsuits, um, federally, uh, federal accessibility lawsuits that were filed last year from January to, um, to, to June. I try not to focus too much on the accessibility lawsuits, but they do exist out there, um, especially in states like California, New York, Florida, and Texas. They do exist. California actually has some very strict laws around disabilities. I'm not going to get into this in this presentation. If you want more information um, on, on, uh, on Title III uh, lawsuits, uh, feel free to look it up. Um, I don't believe in the fear and fear mongering kind of style. What I do like to talk about though, is the good, better, best model, because we tend to think of that idea as if I'm not perfect at accessibility now, then I'm never going to get there, right? Like it's too hard to start. I don't know where to go with this kind of thing. So uh, there's a whole bunch of sites out there, a whole bunch of technology that is in that needs work category. And that's, that's absolutely a reality. Um, it doesn't even meet the web content accessibility guidelines. I short from it for, to WCAG. So if you hear me saying WCAG, it's just the accessibility guidelines. And there's two general levels, which we have to pay attention to, get into that a little bit later as well, level A and level AA. But just for now, if you don't get to that level AA, you're considered non-conformant, non-compliant. Um, and after that, it's just how much better is the experience for the user itself? But truthfully, accessibility is a journey. It's progressive improvements and continuous learning for yourself and for the rest of the organization. I know that for me, I need to work on my user experience knowledge. I have a developer background. I've been consulting on accessibility for almost nine years now. I don't come across very many user experience. Uh, user, I don't have a background in user experience, I should say. So moving up this pyramid takes time. Uh, but our industry, we've been shaming and blaming for too long. And I think that whole fight's better done elsewhere. So I really talk about the progress that we make over time. So on screen, I've got a clock. And really, I want to talk about patience plus persistence equals progress, not perfection. As accessibility consultants, we should be thinking ourselves as coaches, not as police officers. Uh, so we're coaches just like someone would help you out for exercise or diet or saving money or a pair programmer. You've got someone who you sit next to to learn about coding. It's the same thing for accessibility. To reach out to accessibility professional to learn more about this is just the next step in your journey. Okay, uh, I want to talk about a few industries at risk. I'm not going to again go deep into this, like I said before, uh, lawsuits, but really the companies or the industries which have found the most lawsuits uh, are e-commerce, restaurant and food, automotive, uh, financial or insurance types of industries, healthcare or education. So just be aware um, that these types of, of industries have found a little bit of targets on their back just because of the... Of the um, how, how many there are, right? How many e-commerce retail stores are there online with the Shopify plugin? 
well, at one point, some lawyers found it would be a good idea to go and find, okay, let's find all the, uh, the broken Shopify plugins and let's go find those people and, and, and sue them. Remember, it's not the big companies who are affected. To them, it's pennies on the dollar, uh, but it's the smaller companies who create smaller uh, uh, websites. I've heard of pizzerias, like really small companies who, who have decided to shut down their websites because they can't make it compliant. They're not in the web business, but you know we can be. Uh, I just want to say something in the comments here. Uh, um, the, I'm, I'm sorry, if, if, just making sure I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, you were saying, I was thinking of about the curb cut effect and how something that was designed to be disability friendly uh, features end up benefiting every, everybody. And of course, yeah, when my son was born, I was pushing a stroller. How useful was it to have the uh, have curbs that were, were cut, right? The, that were reduced onto the road so I could easily go up that ramp. Um, or pushing my shopping cart right at Costco. Good thing there's there's curb cuts there because I can get in and out of the the store um, uh, really easily. Thank you for that. That's that's a perfect example. If you need another example here, by the way, Netflix back in 2012 was sued by the National Association of the Deaf that there were not enough captions on their online service. Right? Can you believe, remember? At one point, everyone, Netflix was you know shipping DVDs through the mail. I remember that and I was subscribed, uh, but that was, man, 10 years ago that this was sued and they agreed and they said that 100% of their content will have captions by 2014 and all content across their entire platform will be fully captioned within seven, uh, excuse me, all the new content will be captioned within seven days by 2017. And the benefit is we all get subtitles. When my son was born and his wall was adjacent to uh, the TV on, in another room, it sure was useful to have subtitles. And by the way, um, Facebook did a really big research study that 85% of videos on social media is watched now without sound, right? If you're on the bus, if you're in transit, if you're up late at night, sleeping next to your partner and you don't want to turn on the sound, well, you've got your phone and you're watching videos without sound and you've got the captions on. So you're actually missing out. So um, I like to talk about this a lot to marketers because they realize that, oh my gosh, captioning is all of a sudden this really big thing. TikTok gives free captions now. You just turn it on, it automatically detects the voice and you can edit those as well. So something to think about. Yes, it is an extra step, but man, does it ever benefit everyone? All right, a little bit more now in terms of the tech. For anyone who's maybe a team lead manager, maybe you're working on a team, there's a whole idea of shifting left in the world of accessibility because bugs caught in that design phase are so much easier to fix than in the pure uh, development phase itself. So if you catch uh, those design issues, uh, maybe color contrast issues, things like that in the design phase, by the time it gets into production, man, it's really hard for a developer to go back and start fixing. I mean, I'm sure everyone here, if you're in tech, you've had to fix those bugs that you've got to work on in like 18 different places before, that's, uh, that's a pain in the you know what, right, to fix. <laughs> Once it's in production, you got to roll it back or you have to work on it, then it gets re-released. If a user finds those bugs, it's so much easier just to find them in that design process. So on screen, this, uh, this chart I've got, in the design phase, it's 1x to fix it. In the development phase, it's, development phase, it's 6.5 because a developer just has to go back one level. In testing phase, testers find something, hand it back to the developers. The developer says, oh, it's not my problem, hands it back to the designer and so forth. And finally, in the maintenance, of course, it just goes all the way back. So a lot of the work that you do earlier on just pays dividends. And of course, if anyone here has any ear to the business, it converts more sales as well. All right, so that's enough of the business of accessibility. I wanna talk about now the actual fixing and finding issues. So this is where we're gonna get into the tech. So if you, has anyone ever experienced uh, an accessibility audit or has your company ever gone through an accessibility audit? Uh, this is not, I'm not gonna ask you any questions about it. It's very personal information. I know a lot of companies either go through this, but if you've ever experienced an audit, just put it in the chat. I'd love to just, I'm kind of getting an idea of if I have to go really deep into these audits. I'm gonna keep going, but if you have experienced an audit, if your company has ever given you a say, uh, you know, fix all these accessibility issues. Uh, uh, now's the time. I'd love to hear about it. And I've got to give Becca a big kudos, thumbs up. Uh, this is a this is the banner for the for this conversation, this call today. Uh, it's great. It's actually a very accessible uh, banner as well. What I like about it, first off, 
color contrast is there. There's enough color contrast between the white and the darker gray, I believe, uh, background. Um, and you have put a background on there, Becca, so good job. Behind all that text, it really makes it easy to read. Everything is left aligned, so it's easy to read. People with dyslexia experience a lot of issues when they try to read ish, uh, lots of text that's all centered. Um, but really, if you're going fast on, on mobile or something like that, you're scrolling, scrolling. Something like, I heard a stat today, we scroll something like 175 meters of social media per day. That's wild, right? But everything's left aligned. There's a proper background behind the text that needs it. Uh, there's a nice transparency here. So thumbs up. This is a nice, successful. Um, I mean, I know we're not designers, but I just thought I'd call that out. One thing I'd also like to mention is that 38% of audit issues have to do with forms. And that's kind of what we build all the time, right? Missing labels, incorrect focus highlighting, error messages that aren't done correctly, and form validation that's not correct. And this can either be enlightening or terrifying. I don't know how many forms that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but sometimes some of these requirements come from the client, right? That, uh, uh, you know, put a placeholder instead of a label on there. Well, unfortunately, having a label on your form element is a requirement of the accessibility guidelines. Um, yes, screen readers do read placeholders, but for sighted users, if you put data into the form, and then you put, uh, then you no longer know what that form is about. I'm going to show some examples on that in a little bit here. So, okay, another big part of interaction here. I've got a simple contact us form on screen. What's wrong with this form? Put in the chat. Do you know anything that's wrong with this form off the top? Uh, what would you do to change this? What, is, in your opinion, is wrong with this form? Accessibility or not, it could be a design issue. Um, what do you think is wrong with this form? while I take a sip of water. Liz said contrast looks iffy. Yep, low color contrast. Yeah, the gray of that, those inputs is, is pretty light. Yeah, placeholder text goes away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I actually like this, when I, when I usually talk about this form, I talk about the fact that actually it's also quite complicated. When we think about planning and building things, we tend to jump as technologists, let's say, uh, we tend to jump right to building. And it's something that's really easy for us to do. Um, I'm speaking more to the solopreneurs, the consultants, those kinds of people who are on the call, uh, when we build things, we just say, yep, let's get some requirements in and then, and then put it right into code and put it right into the form here. I would say that the biggest problem on this form, in my opinion, is that it's actually taking a little bit too much data. It's a bit overcomplicated. So let's talk about overcomplication here and how simplification benefits people. Senior citizens, overcomplication forms is a big problem. English as a second language, forms that can be overcomplicated, can be uh, difficult to understand, hard to, uh, hard to read, and hard to understand what data needs to be put in there. As a contact us form, do we really need date of birth? Do we really need phone number? Do we really need how did you find us? These are some questions that to bring back to your client uh, might be something really important. To people with cognitive disabilities or partially blind who don't use a screen reader, some of the issues here about simplification could really benefit them. I've, I follow someone online. Her name is Meryl Evans. If you're not following Meryl, by the way, you should be. She's on LinkedIn. She's just fantastic. She's deaf. And uh, I'm going to read out what's on screen here. So she said that we need to change the process for forms to make them more inclusive. There's a field on online forms that frustrates a lot of deaf and hard of hearing folks. If you care to guess which one, it's the phone number field. Often it's a required field. I just read another deaf person's story about applying for jobs and needing to fill that field. He said he doesn't have a phone number. He's already frustrated with the job hunting process and this exacerbates it. And she put a screenshot of the cell phone number requirement field. I'm gonna admit, I've been doing this for a while and I'd never even thought of um, uh, like uh, the phone number field before. Maybe asking users their preferred method of contacting is a better way of doing it than 
just putting a phone number field, right? And by the way, Gen Z, you know, never wants to be contacted anyway by phone. So um, if you can add more optional fields instead of required and just put the, mo the, ba the bare minimum of what you need. So contact simplification, I changed this contact form to only full name with a placeholder text. Uh, how did you find us? With again, placeholder text, a comment, which usually doesn't need placeholders, but you could do it anyway. And putting an email with the example in there as well. And still, I didn't fix the color contrast. I've been corrected many times in this too. So just for something like forms, I always like to start with forms. Like I said, the bare minimum you need for forms should be a label on each control, providing additional instructions when needed, such as placeholders or more information uh, on, on data that's required to fill in the form, or if it's complicated, what the requirements are like password requirements, visual cues, like focus indicators on each and every single focusable element here, and a logical order on all forms. Don't have your tab order be, uh, like for example, if there's a multi-column form, it shouldn't go first name, address, last name, country, it really should follow that logical order, first name, last name, uh, uh, address, country, that, that should be a given. And make sure that you identify mandatory fields properly as well. Uh, Lisa, you're asking, does the position of the label make a difference? Generally, no. Generally, it's okay. As long as you have a visual label on screen, I've even seen, you know, Google material design, they have a label, which is pretty clever, which as soon as you focus on that field, uh, it moves up and just above there too. That's okay. There's some mixed results in there from some people, but I would say that, like, again, this is a journey. If your client really is, is against having labels on there, something is better than nothing. So any kind of visual label is okay in my mind. Depending again on the complexity of the form, most forms are going to need things like grouping related controls. Your checkboxes, your radio buttons should all be operable with a keyboard. Uh, you should just be able to tab through and use arrow keys to select different elements. Form validation or input validation is, is required as well. So uh, make sure that if uh, something is in an error state, it highlights it. It's very clear as to what uh, form field is an error, not just you know uh, a red border. Something that really shows you know please enter this data or you know for example like an email address that's not correct. Say you know this is incorrect data in this field. Something like that. Useful placeholders like we mentioned already. Very very important. Uh, to provide additional information to users as well. And finally, on some forms, longer forms, additional forms, things like that, um, notifying users of what elements are incorrect, that could be something that benefits users as well. Like just you have a long form and says, you know, please correct the errors. It'll actually indicate which form fields are in an error state. Um, offering stages, you know, stage one, uh, sorry, step one, step two, step three, if it's a really long form, and allowing users to save their progress through that form as well is going to be hugely beneficial. Um, allowing users to input any data they want. I like to give the example here in Canada, we have a postal code that's uh, letter, number, letter, number, letter, number. Some forms require a space to be between the first three characters and the last three characters. Super frustrating. There's no indication of that anywhere. It just like doesn't allow you to continue with the form of that. Like, no, users should allow, be allowed to enter data as they choose and your front end development should be able to handle all that data gracefully as well. And also on really long forms, indicating the time to complete. These are all gonna be things, especially for users with cognitive issues, um, seniors, uh, having the time, the estimated time to complete is going to be really, really useful to them. And uh, allowing that time out to handle that as well is, is very graceful as well. Uh, Rebecca, you're asking, uh, what are some options for extremely long forms from PDFs to websites? Uh, is there something that would have accessibility in mind or is it better to code from scratch? This is always up to uh, the developer and the situation, right? Recoding something from scratch, if you're taking great design and accessibility and coding principles to it, go forth and rebuild and redesign. Because in the back backend, um, uh, the, the PDF standard is very similar now to HTML, or um, I think it's uh, UTF. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's UTF, uh, but there are accessible uh, forms as well for PDFs, but that's a whole other uh, discussion in, in, than, than this one. Um, if you want more information on PDFs, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, something like that. I've got a ton of information on PDFs that I can give you on how to make them accessible, but really you're going to be doing a lot of legwork. 
But just gonna let everyone know, if you're building something in Word, okay, Microsoft has done a great job at translating a Microsoft project, uh, excuse me, Microsoft products like Word and PowerPoint to PDF in a pretty accessible way, as long as the source document is made accessible. Um, but yeah, PDFs are their own type of conversation, their own type of beast. And usually you need uh, Adobe Pro to fix them. So just, just be aware of that. All right, but I want to say that for developers, the single most important behavior that we can do to change uh, our behavior is we don't need to install anything. We don't need any plugins and no browser tools because sometimes the organizations that we consult with or sometimes the companies that we work for don't allow us to install plugins or browsers. So if you can't remember anything else in this specific presentation, all I want you to do, all I want you to commit to is tabbing and entering. Okay, after you build your, your feature, you've done that ticket, uh, you know, the form is complete or the button's created, tab, 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 enter, enter, enter. Just make sure that there's focus outlines around everything and every interactive element, checkboxes, radio buttons, drop down menus, buttons, uh, links, uh, each of those should have a focus outline and you should be able to interact with it using space or enter. Liz, you're saying that sometimes forms with auto tab uh, to the next input field when the form thinks the user has finished inputting data. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. You're asking if that's just a big uh, no-no. I would say it's a big no-no because you know uh, a user may not understand that they're moving to the next field either. So it sounds, you know, a lot of these forms or a lot of these features are created with the best intention. We're saying, hey, you know, you enter one character in this, and that it immediately moves to the next character. Uh, the next box to enter data. Well, what was so wrong with just entering the data in a simple form field before and having a user tab? Anytime you circumvent the normal browser behavior really starts to confuse users who can't see that information on screen. So I say, don't do it. I wouldn't say like, there's nothing explicitly in the accessibility guidelines that say don't do it, but really, Taking a step back, it's just creating more work for maintenance as well. So sometimes uh, those extra features, they really don't add any benefits. So yeah, for screen reader users, I would say test it. You, testing is hugely important. Turn on a screen reader. And there's some free ones that I can recommend at the end of this call. Uh, test it and see how that sounds. Does it totally throw you off? Does it read the label? What's going on? And you'll probably see that those extra little features um, just create more confusion. All right. Um, some other things to uh, watch out for, uh, missing focus indicators, broken interactive links, um, uh, excuse me, uh, with tabbing and entering, you can also discover hidden elements, right? We all know sometimes there's these hidden elements on the screen, you're tabbing, you're like, what's this focused on? I don't even know what's this, some hidden element behind the scenes. Um, it identifies the wrong focus order, it'll figure, find buttons that don't work, you know, and more. So I want to take a second here. This is called Accessibility Insights for Web. Uh, I used to just talk about it, but I'm actually going to give a live demo of this. So I'm going to just close this and I'm going to share my screen. I'm actually going to just share the, hey, the Meetup website. All right. So how does meetup.com work for accessibility? Um, just going to take a quick, can everyone see my screen? Can you just, someone just pop in the chat, give me a thumbs up or something like that uh, uh, for <laughs> uh, if they can see my screen. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate that. Okay. So what have we got on screen here? So we've got all these red exclamation marks. I'm just going to blow that up a little bit. Uh, so this is a Microsoft product and I actually really like this one. I'm going to show a few alternatives as well to this. So what happens when you uh, check this website for accessibility concerns? Well, what happens is that we see a lot of these attributes which don't really work. And by the way, automated accessibility checkers, automated accessibility tools, they only find about 40 to 50% of accessibility issues. Nothing replaces manual hands-on accessibility checks. So that's why I really encourage all the developers that I speak to to tab through your application, press enter. An automated tool will not be able to do that for you. Just keep that in mind. So what have we got here? We've got um, ARIA attributes that don't work properly. Um, let's find something that's kind of easy. So we've got color contrast issues, uh, duplicate image alt text. Okay, let's go to this one here because I think that's probably the easiest one. So what have we got here? We've got images should have alt text on them. So um, alt text, 
Alternative text is this nice way of saying it's a different descriptor to images. So it benefits two areas. Originally, it was conceived for um, if ever the image doesn't load from the server properly, well, then at least there'll be a text description. But also, it's very useful for users who um, are visually impaired and who use screen readers or other assistive technology that it will read out the description of the image itself. But the way I like to describe it is that it's an alternative description that benefits SEO. So if anyone works in marketing or things like that, remember, use your alt text because it benefits your SEO. Sally, you asked me, is this a free extension? Yes, it is a free extension. I'm also going to show a different extension called Axe in just a moment here. And they have varying results between them. Of course, um, accessibility is not a one and done or a black and white type of scenario. Uh, so this does, uh, there are different uh, tools that you can use as well. Let's load up Axe here. But this is a, this is a free tool. But what I really like about the Microsoft one is that in the ad hoc tools. Let me just load that up here, click this, and uh, let's turn off the automated checks for a moment. I wanna look at tab stops because I this is the big game changer for me. Now what I can do is I can tab through this application and I can see exactly what the tab order is. So look at this one. I've got this focus state, which is just randomly up here above the welcome cam. What is that? I don't even know what that is. So a screen reader user, or a keyboard only user would have an additional stop somewhere that has no focus or shouldn't even get focus. Let me inspect this for a moment. Let me just take a quick peek at the code and see what's going on here. Like, what did I focus on here? So, um, hold on, let me refresh my screen. So a focus state there, focus, 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 focus. And, um, oh, it looks like I fell in the calendar. So what's going on there? Why did that, hey, this just jumped down for a second. Hold on. All right, so see, I'm getting different results here no matter what. Uh, so that, that's kind of a funny result too. So inconsistency between, um, you know, different states. Maybe it was on their, their um, uh, the tablet view or something like that. Maybe there's something there. Uh, yes, Lisa, I'll be adding all of these uh, links in the chat. No problem. Uh, just give me a moment. And I can get that to you. So where's that focus state here? So it fell on something here. So I can now turn on my uh, console and I can say document dot active element font dot body. So all of a sudden I've got the, oops, let's pop this out for a second. Try that again. So focus states on something here. What is that? So I've got this random input. So I've got an input above this welcome cam. I don't know what it is, right? It's got a search for keywords label on it. Visually, I don't see that. If I'm a keyboard only user, I'm going to experience an extra focus state where I don't know where it's not supposed to be. What? Like what, what is this supposed to be? So uh, these are the types of things that you'll discover by just using tab and enter in your application after you build it, after the feature, after the ticket you build it. Accessibility insights for web, Chrome web store. Actually, I'm just gonna put in the, um, uh, the Microsoft page here. I'm gonna pop that right in the chat. So if you wanna download it, that's the plugin to use. I'm gonna give an alternative as well which is called X, which I'll just load up in a second here. Refresh this page. So an alternative to accessibility insights for web is a tool called X, uh, which just pop this back into here. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, X is gone. I don't know, happened my axe. Okay, let's just see if the plugin went dead for some reason. Axe tools. Hmm. I'm not sure where it went. All right, um, I can show you uh, a different tool instead. So one is called Wave and one is called uh, Lighthouse. So um, Lighthouse is part of the browser already. So this is also useful for anyone who cannot install any browser plugins on their uh, corporate 
uh, corporate website or things like that, you've already got an accessibility tool. It's not perfect. And your the report that you get out of this doesn't actually give you any information. Uh, sorry, it's like the, the number that you get at the end doesn't mean that your site is fully accessible either. So people will generate these reports and say, hey, it's accessible. You still need to do manual testing, but a lot of the automated things um, are checked for you for free. Um, Lisa, you mentioned that there's an AXE conference every year. Denise, it just passed actually. So it was in March of this year. But what's nice about AXE, AXCon is that all the um, all their, all their uh, presentations are all available for free. You can go to axcon.com, I believe. Axcon.com. Uh, um, actually, axcon. Just search for axcon. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if axcon.com is that. I was just waiting for this to load. Um, but look up axcon and you will find all the talks. They're all available for free. And um, there's some great, great information in there. Much, much more in depth than what I, we can cover in the you know, hour and 15 that we're here. Okay, so what are some of the other issues that we found here? So REA IDs are not unique, uh, background, and actually shows you, it takes little screenshots of what the problems are and how to fix it. So this is also another tool in your tool belt. Thanks for popping that in there, Lisa, I appreciate that. Heading elements are not sequential. Um, this is important because um, heading levels should progress, H1, H2, H3, H4. What I find is neat about this conversation around accessibility always is we're just talking about semantic HTML, aren't we? We should be putting uh, headings in a proper focus, uh, in a proper order, uh, because that's what the HTML specification recommends too. So sometimes in our um, in the WordPress templates that we use, it's not like that by default, but a lot of um, uh, these web builders are allowing us to add extra accessibility attributes to these non-compliant, non-conformant elements, which only helps down the road. Wix actually, got a shout out to Wix. Wix has been doing a great job with their accessibility lately. In fact, you can customize a ton of stuff with Wix. If you use a website builder, maybe you're a freelancer or something like that, Wix has got a whole accessibility component to that, which is actually pretty good. I may be building websites out of Wix in the future just because I saw some of those really good accessibility features in there. All right, with that. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the common accessibility guideline issues, the WCAG issues that keep coming up again and again and again. Uh, probably the major one. So this, this research came out of a company called WebAIM and every year they analyze the top million websites or something like that um, of, of uh, you know, what the main problems are um, on the web for accessibility issues. So sorry, it's every two years, not every year. Uh, that's why this one's from February, 2021. The main problem is low text contrast, which we may think as developers as maybe that's not my problem, but if we can flag it, if we can find it, then you know we can, we can help fix it. Uh, missing alternative text for images, back to that alt text. And by the way, I'm gonna be showing examples of each of these in code in just a moment here. Uh, missing form input labels. Once again, forms come back, empty links, which is a big one. Uh, missing document language and empty buttons. Um, these all have percentages next to them, uh, but you know these are just the biggest problems that keep coming up again and again. Okay, let's talk about low text contrast. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just there's not enough contrast between the foreground and the background. There's a free tool called Color Contrast Analyzer. Just give me a second. I'm going to put that in here. And it's British spelling. It's from a, a company in the UK, uh, and so and so they have this great tool. It's free and it shows us and can. You, there's just an eyedropper where you pick two colors and it'll analyze the color contrast between those two and will tell you if it passes or fails. So the minimum in it generally for text is 4.5 to one. If it's large text, then you're okay um, to with uh, three to one or if it's uh, buttons or any interactive elements, then you can also pass with three to one. I, if we have time today, I'll give a demo of this tool, but it's a really great tool uh, just to kind of test out which um, uh, the color contrast between certain elements. Uh, Sally, you put, is it true that colors in a logo do not have to conform to uh, WCAG? Yes, that's actually true. That is actually true. So any type of logos or, or graphics uh, representing a company do not have to conform. Uh, there's a, um, a big example around Coca-Cola recently who made a different branding. I think it was for International Day of Pink, where they had pink on their red 
logo, right? They change other color patterns. And so, yes, that is an exemption actually, but really when we talk about branding, which I know is not really part of this conversation for <laughs> with a lot of developers, but the branding conversation does come to, if you can make something easy to read, like if your whole um, uh, website is using your branding colors and those are the same colors that's on your logo, just be aware and be warned. I know Sally, that wasn't part of the question, but just be aware that sometimes your branding colors and your logo color, you, you know, if they're not, in, if, if you're using your branding colors for the rest of your website, they could be out of sync. Then all of a sudden you've got your logo in one color and your website another. Just something to be aware of, but Sally, you are correct. Your logo does not have to conform to WCAG guidelines. Next up, missing alt text. So there's only two things you need to really remember about this. Not all images, all images require the alt text attribute, but not all images require content in the alt text attribute. So for example here, if I had a website where I was talking about my trip to Kolkata, then uh, this image here, uh, I should put an alt text next to it because I would be putting uh, as an alt text, a building in Kolkata. But if this is just a general architectural uh, website or maybe just examples of, um, oh, I don't know, if this is just filler, because sometimes we go to Unsplash or some of the other free uh, image uh, websites and we download them. Those images, if they're just filler images, they don't require text in alt text. And I'll tell you this, as someone who speaks to people who have, who are you know, blind individuals who use um, um, screeners all the time, it really does bog down their, their experience on the web by having constant, constant alt text all the time. So if there's similar information surrounding that graphic, you probably do not need alt text on there. I like to give an example again in banking world, um, uh, like if you had a credit card image and then the exact content below of what benefits that credit card would have, you probably don't need alt text on that credit card image. Uh, Lisa says, uh, would a product image for e-commerce be considered decorative when there's a full description of the product? Yeah. And this is hotly debated. I say no. I say no because there's an immediate, like there's a description right below. You still do need the alt attribute on all those images or else you're going to get flagged all over the place for SEO. But as a user, if that was a link, and I know in e-commerce, you've got an image of the product and then maybe a link to the product right after that. And then the description of the product right underneath that. Well, a user is going to hear, you know, I don't know, football, and then the product description being football, right? They're going to hear football, football all the time. If you had a product listing, a PLP page, and all of a sudden you've got like a hundred uh, uh, graphics that say the same thing as what's right below them, you're just adding extra content for nothing. You can remove the, 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 the text inside there and um, just have uh, a blank alt text there. Denise, you're asking, is it important to describe colors in alt text? Um, sometimes, yes, definitely. If the alt text was maybe pick your color for a t-shirt, well, then absolutely. That little swatch icon, that's when you definitely need, especially for me, I'm colorblind. I like to hover my mouse over uh, each of those different elements and find out, hopefully someone has put some alt text in there so I can read and know to pick the, uh, the blue shirt instead of the purple one or what have you. Um, but if, if the context requires it, think of text, uh, 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 alt text length, like tweet length. So for example, if I was describing, um, oh, I don't know, um, off the top of my head, one of those Chinese lion dances, right? Um, and I wanted to describe the gold and red uh, lion dance and how they were dancing around, that might be important because me as a sighted user, I would pick that up as well. So yes, in that situation, I would absolutely put color. But in this example, what I've got on screen here with just this image, Mm, there's probably not too much color that needs to be uh, needs to be added. It's best not to uh, worry too much about it because alt text, as long as you have alt text in there, is the most important part. Adding more information uh, does help, but keep it tweet length, so the 140 characters ish. Uh, Lisa, you're asking uh, if the empty alt attribute is missing, how does that hurt SEO? No, the the alt. Sorry, maybe I, I didn't describe that properly. Having the alt attribute there. Um, is what benefits SEO. Um, um, I'm not an SEO expert. All I know is that the images, like your banner image and things like that, that should describe, or especially your logo, the first image on the page is often a logo at the top left. That should have, you know, your company name. If it's the company logo, it should have the company name in that alt text in there. Um, uh, or any descriptions of text, images of text should have that entire text in there. But as a, you know, a 
PLP page, something like that, you, you don't need alt text in each of those. That will not negatively affect SEO. It's only if there is no alternative text um, attribute in there that it affects it. Thank you. Okay, missing labels. We talked about this briefly when I talked about forms. Um, two ways uh, of, of generally doing uh, labels. You can, uh, you can assign a label using the label for attribute and point it to the input. Finally, you can nest a label as well uh, by wrapping the input inside of a label attribute. Both of these are semantically correct according to the HTML standard. And this is really important for things like checkboxes too. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can click on the text of the checkbox and it'll check that checkbox? Some of these benefits are that for users um, uh, who need larger uh, clicking areas, maybe a senior citizens or someone who, you know, I don't know, I don't always like to find that small pointing area and clicking on the checkbox. Sometimes it's nice to just click the text. That's a big indicator big help. So when that's all assigned properly, that will, um, that's associated and will be checked off properly. Um, empty links are a really big one here. Uh, social icons, I see it all the time on websites. Social icons still need text. So on screen, I've got an image of um, an anchor. So here I've got, you know, my Twitter link. And so inside I've got an icon. So even though this is a link with just an icon inside, I put an ARIA label on there that says, follow Cam Baudouin on Twitter. Okay, I don't even use Twitter anymore. It's an old slide. Follow me on LinkedIn if you're going to follow me somewhere. Um, but this would still require some kind of label because when a user falls on this uh, link, it still will read the proper alt text. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Follow me on LinkedIn instead. Okay, finally, missing language attribute. This is a really big one. Part of the HTML specification says that we should be um, adding the lang attribute to, um, uh, to all our HTML content. So lang en for English, lang fr for French, lang es. And by the way, the lang attribute can go on any attribute. So if you've got a multi, uh, multilingual website, uh, internationalization is important to you, you can actually put it on. I know in here in Canada, we have, you know, multi-language selector, uh, English, and then Francais. So you can actually put the Lang attribute on the div, the span, the button on there. And what happens is a screener to user will actually hear that language natively in that language. So it'll say Francais with a French accent. So this is really important too. And by the way, this all just kind of adds, uh, this will be flagged by most accessibility checkers as well. Next up are empty buttons. So just like the links, Empty buttons are a big one too. So I put an example in here. The first one was an icon where I added ARIA label. This is uh, an image where I'm adding an alt text once again, where uh, you should add more information to this one too. So this image, when we went back to descriptive versus informative images, this would be an informative image. So you need to put more information about, I don't know, account number or more information about what have you. Because just having information in there is generally not enough. So just a quick word on focus indicators, because this kind of is that blurred line between design and development. Which of these focus indicators is, is okay? Well, both of these are actually okay. Having a focus indicator is the most important. Never put uh, outline equals uh, zero or none in your, um, uh, in your CSS. It just, it's, it's so bad. You can change it, but don't eliminate it. So if you don't have outline equals null, uh, sorry, if you do have outline equals null, then what you can do is you can put, I don't know, border and you can add dotted border like I've got on screen here. You can add an underline. I like to talk about the rule of two, which is two differentiators. So for example, I've got blue, a blue outline and it's dotted. Well, that's a great pattern as well as uh, a color difference as well. On the bottom, I've got, you know, the same kind of thing. Visually indicating where a, a user is on screen is just hugely important. Right. Just a quick recap here. I know we went through a lot. There's a lot to talk about about accessibility. I hope this has been a nice, broad, uh, kind of general talk about that. Don't design cockpits for nobody, right? Allow users to consume their information how they prefer. And don't forget that usability does trump design every single time. So allowing a user to use their, uh, your content how they choose is the most important. You're trying to plan your information before you actually build it. So if you're planning something like a new form, which is where I always like to start, think about labels and instructions and validation and required fields and placeholders before 
anything else. And by the way, if you are looking to broaden your scope a little bit here, if you need a good book on usability, I do recommend Don't Make Me Think by Dan Krug. I know this is more of a tech talk, but uh, changing that, uh, that discussion is, is really good. I'm just going to put that in the chat. Um, don't make me think. And Krug, it's a great book. Oops. Everyone. It's a great book. Lots of great information in there. Um, I really did uh, put a lot of sticky notes in there. Um, just one more thought, just before we go here, that I've been working in accessibility for about nine years now. And the discussion around accessibility has now been easier today than it ever has before. So like I said earlier on, there was a, uh, there's a movement going on right now around accessibility. Companies are now paying attention to it. So if you meet resistance, know that A, you're not alone. And there are lots and lots and lots of resources out there. We talked about some great ones today. Uh, AxCon is lots of information around uh, accessibility and AxCon, that's kind of all they do. CSUN, C-S-U-N is another conference that goes on. It is paid. Um, ID24, I'm going to put that in there. Um, ID24, uh, they're great. They happened in September. Uh, that is just a conference all around kind of design and accessibility. They've got tons and tons of tons of information. But the best teams I work with are highly collaborative and highly communicative. And that really does lend to a positive accessibility experience. Uh, Lisa, you're just asking which form builder plugin was I referring to in the previous slide. Um, I like to use Forminator if I'm building a WordPress site. Uh, also, Gravity Forms did a huge accessibility uh, work. So one of those two has a lot of accessibility features. You can ping me if you need any more help with that. And with that, I want to say thanks for attending. Thanks for participating in this. Thanks for the uh, the, the chat as well. And uh, sure, Sally, just give me one moment there. Um, follow me on LinkedIn. I post daily accessibility tips. Um, all like that's kind of all I do right now. I've been I do full time consulting and full time speaking on accessibility. So if you know someone, an event planner or or uh, someone in your organization who's looking for a speaker on accessibility, uh, please reach out. Speaking at cambodway.com. And don't be shy. If you need any help on uh, on this topic, just reach out on LinkedIn. I'm always up for having a conversation on this anytime. And with that, Becca, I'll maybe hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, Kim, and to everyone who attended today. This was a great discussion, and I hope everyone learned a lot. And we'll see you at future events. Have a great night, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.